Good evening, everyone. Uh, here's our disclaimer statement as we're a public company uh, quoted on AIM. Uh, so Renewron, for those of you that aren't familiar with us, uh, we are a cell therapy development business uh, at clinical stage. We have a presence in the UK and the US. Um, our primary goal is converting stem cell science into cell-based therapeutic products. And we've been doing this for a number of years and our lead program now is, is targeting retinal disease or retinitis pigmentosa uh, specifically. That's a clinical stage program in phase 2A. And it's where I'll spend most of the time uh, this evening taking you through that program and the data we've generated so far. And that's clinical data that we're very excited by. Um, we do have other technologies as well, including exosomes derived from one of our other stem cell lines and induced pluripotent stem cells as well. And towards the end, I'll take you through those programs in overview. And those are very much being pursued as collaborative efforts with other pharmaceutical companies. And we'll explain why that is uh, uh, later on in the presentation. Just a few words more on the individual platform technologies we have. So the core asset that we're working with now in terms of our in-house resource and where most of the spend and effort is going is our HRPCs, our human retinal progenitor cells on the left hand side here on this slide uh, and as mentioned those are being targeted uh, against retinal disease uh, retinal diseases diseases that are characterized by loss of photoreceptors at the back of the eye leading ultimately to blindness um, we found a way both to um, scale up and manufacture if you like these cells in a cryo reserve form so in other words to be able to freeze these cells down so that they can be stored and shipped and used when required so trying to essentially get them as close as we can to a commercializable therapy or product that can be used readily at the clinical center or hospital. As mentioned, we have some very positive early phase 2A data targeting this asset against retinitis pigmentosa, and I'll come back to that uh, a little later. On the right-hand side of the panel, um, you see CTX cells. That's our second stem cell asset. It's a neural stem cell line. And this one is also a clinical stage asset, and it's been uh, targeting stroke disability at a clinical level for a good few years now, and has potentially in other diseases as well, like traumatic brain injury and Huntington's disease. And this one is now being pursued as an out-licensed uh, asset. So we're not going to invest more of our own resources into this program. We're going to partner it out. And indeed, both assets have already been partnered uh, for the Chinese market with Fosun Pharma. Fosun Pharma being a major Chinese pharmaceutical company, one of the top three in that territory, and Fosun Pharma, as, as some of you may know, um, have substantial interests in the West, both in healthcare and also beyond healthcare as well. So it's a great partner for us, and importantly, having done a deal at this stage with both of those assets lends a fair deal of validation, if you will, in the eyes of a third party in terms of Fosun doing extensive due diligence before they licensed those assets uh, about 18 months ago. Uh, the middle two panels cover our exosome platform and our, HR, uh, our IPSC platform. Both of these platforms use our CTX cells. So in other words, we can derive exosomes using CTX cells as a producer cell line, and we can produce induced pluripotent stem cells, again, from CTX cells as the starting material, if you will. And these two uh, new platforms, have therapeutic potential in a number of new areas, uh, which I won't go into in great detail in the interest of time, but it just adds further exploitation potential and value potential, if you will, in our business from the assets that we've already been working with. So it's leveraging what we already have. And as you see on the, the development chart here, as mentioned, our HRPCs targeting retinitis pigmentosa is our most advanced asset, is in phase two clinical development, importantly with further readouts from a phase two A study expected over the next 12 months. With our other assets, our exosome platform and our IPSC platform, uh, again, you can see these are targeting a number of new therapeutic areas. And the key here is to generate proof of concept data at the preclinical level over the next six months to a year as a prelude to, get, to garnering uh, out license deals with these programs with the partners that we're working with currently in research collaborations. And again, I'll come back to that towards the end. So let's move on more specifically to our HRPC program uh, in retinal disease. 
So HRPC stands for human retinal progenitor cells. These are allogeneic or non-patient specific uh, stem cells targeting retinitis pigmentosa as the first indication for clinical development. And by allogeneic, I mean non-patient specific. So this is a, these are cells that can be administered to any patient that presents with the disease that we're targeting, retinitis pigmentosa, um, and doesn't depend on the patient's own stem cells in terms of um, developing a, a therapy uh, to target this particular disease. So again, it's trying to use the power of stem cell science to generate a therapeutic uh, candidate that can be deployed as broadly as possible in the target patient population. Importantly, we know that our HRPCs have the ability to differentiate into those photoreceptors that are lost in blindness causing diseases and also have the ability to integrate into the retina, into the retina and thereby engender therapeutic benefit, um, either arresting site deterioration in these patients and all being well to even improve sight in the, in the patients that we're treating or want to treat. Um, we know that HRPCs also have therapeutic potential beyond retinitis pigmentosa in a range of other blindness causing diseases. Um, our program also has orphan drug designation in Europe and in the US and fast track designation from FDA. And that's important because it confers advantages in terms of speed of clinical development and also market exclusivity if we can get this product through to market, provided no better alternative, uh, alternatives exist uh, when we get there. Um, I mentioned that we'd found a way to scale or manufacture these cells under requisite good manufacturing practice standards. And we've worked in collaboration with academic uh, institutions, both in the US and in the UK, um, in order to optimize this technology so that we can scale these cells, characterize them in a very consistent and quality controlled manner. And importantly, as I mentioned, to cryopreserve preserve them, giving them a long shelf life and therefore ease of manufacture, storage and use. Um, RP is a large orphan market, um, and there is already one approved product called Luxterna that addresses a narrow part of that uh, RP patient population. Importantly, Luxterna has an extremely high price, um, and orphan products typically, as I'm sure you know, do command high pricing in market because of the rarity of the underlying disease. And that's what makes them uh, interesting from an out-licensing potential. They're good pipeline fillers, if you like, for larger pharmaceutical companies because of that uh, swiftness to market and the fact that that commercial exclusivity can exist when you get there. Um, so just moving on, um, like I mentioned Luxterna. Luxterna is administered actually by subretinal injection, and that is the technique that we're also using to inject our cell therapy to the back of the eye to engender these beneficial effects. Uh, so again, it's a well-established procedure already used with a market of treatment. Just a quick word on retinitis pigmentosa. It is a, a, an unmet medical need. Um, RP is essentially a collection of over 100 gene defects, of which Luxterna addresses one, uh, RPE 65, and that's around anywhere between one to 3% of the overall RP patient population. What we're looking to do with our product, our HRPC cells, is to address the entirety of the RP patient population. In other words, with a gene independent approach, a cell therapy, as opposed to a gene therapy. And as you can see in the panels on the right hand side, RP is a disease manifests itself by a gradual loss in peripheral vision, leading ultimately over a number of years uh, to blindness, unfortunately, in these patients. So in terms of clinical development, uh, we've completed a phase one clinical study using HRPCs in retinitis pigmentosa uh, patients. This was run in the US at two sites, uh, and we've now moved it into a phase two A study where we, we've already treated 10 patients. Again, these are established retinitis pigmentosa patients. Uh, we are administering cells at a 1 million cell dose. The primary endpoint again in phase 2A being safety, but also we're monitoring for visual, uh, for visual acuity and other efficacy measures to see if we can garner any efficacy signal in this study. And what we've been uh, very, very surprised and encouraged by is the, uh, the level of efficacy we've seen so far. And that's exemplified on this chart. So what this chart shows you in the nine patients that we have treated where efficacy has been shown um, is a very uh, substantial increase in visual acuity in these patients when measured against the untreated eye. So in these patients, 
uh, each patient gets a dose of these cells in one eye and the other eye is left untreated. So it kind of acts as a quasi-control. And importantly, what we're looking to see here is a difference in visual acuity between the number of letters uh, that the patient's able to read with the treated eye versus the untreated eye. And you can see those differences marked in light blue uh, on the top part of the chart here in the table. Um, and then in terms of the graph, light blue is obviously the treated eye, and the untreated eye visual acuity measures uh, are in dark blue. And you can see that we have data now right the way out to 18 months, five, four, five days, albeit uh, only in one patient, uh, out to 18 months. Uh, but consistently what we're seeing is, an, is, is a delta, a difference, or an, an improvement in the, um, the number of letters read uh, uh, when comparing the treated eye with the untreated eye. And that's very, very encouraging for us to have that maintenance effect right out to a year and beyond. And again, just focusing on the one year uh, endpoint where we have five patients that have followed up to that time point, uh, this chart just shows you how each of those five patients at 12 months have responded in terms of the ETDRS letters read um, uh, uh, in terms of the treated eye. So the mean is just under 12 letters read. And by the way, ETDRS is just the standard chart uh, that is used when testing um, for visual acuity in these patients. It's almost it's very similar to the uh, to the chart you'd see in an opticians, but it's not the same. But, but essentially, the patient is tested on their ability to read letters at a declining size, in declining size as you as you move down the chart. Uh, but importantly, this what this uh, graph shows is 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 a very very encouraging response rate. So three out of the five patients that have reached twelve month follow up can actually actually had ETDRS readings of ten letters or above. And that's really, really meaningful in terms of getting a provable product. If we can replicate these data in the extra patients that we want to treat in this study and in the pivotal study that follows, then we believe this will lead to an approvable uh, uh, product. So with that in mind, what are we looking to do with this, uh, with this program? Well, we do now have uh, regulatory approval, both in the UK and in the US. Uh, to continue this study, but we're actually going to increase the dose to amplify further the efficacy signal we've already seen because we know it's safe to do so. And we've also enhanced some of the measures that we're going to be using in the, in the extra nine patients we now want to treat. Uh, again, just to give ourselves the best shot on goal in terms of measuring uh, uh, efficacy signals uh, in the patients that we're treating. Um, and we've also opened the uh, study to a number of new sites now, both in the US and also in the UK, and we're hoping to, to open a site in mainland Europe as well. So what are the next steps for the platform uh, and for the program? Uh, well, uh, as mentioned, the, the key thing over the next 12 months is to uh, complete this phase 2A study. Because it's open label, we'll be able to report progress as we go. And the best way to do that is to present the data as it comes through in conference. And in the second half of the slide here, there are a number of conferences such as AAO, ARVO, ASRS. These are key scientific ophthalmology conferences which, which give us an opportunity to present the data from this study as the data matures over the next 12 months. And that's key to us in terms of being able to show progress with this study as a gateway to getting into a single pivotal study to take us through to market. Uh, we also would like to test the HRPCs in indications beyond RP. Again, we see this as a platform, not just a, 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 a candidate that, that, that can only target one particular disease. And importantly, if we can garner the data in phase 2A, we believe this will open up opportunities to secure high value partnering deals if we choose to partner this out at that stage. And I'll come back to deal values and what can be achieved in the sector um, towards the end of the presentation. Um, just in terms of the competitive landscape, uh, so these are the runners and riders that we regard as our peer group, if you like, in terms of companies that are developing advanced therapies, be they cell therapies or gene therapies, or back of the eye retinal degenerative diseases such as RP. Um, and basically, a lot of these companies um, have generated real value. In most cases, they're further ahead than we are, uh, but they've generated real value through generation of positive clinical data uh, and the deal making that comes with that, be that out license deals or eventual M&A takeouts by a large pharma or large biotech. And we see, we very much see ourselves in that milieu 
uh, and our clear aim is to generate the data over the next 12 months and beyond to get us there. So in the time that remains, just a quick word on our exosome platform. Uh, exosomes, uh, as I mentioned, or I may have mentioned at the start, can be derived from stem cells, and that's what we're doing with our CTX stem cells. Um, and they are nano-sized vesicles that are secreted by stem cells. Um, it was previously thought that they were conveyors of cellular junk, but it's now known that they play a vital role in intercellular communication. And we believe that um, the exosomes derived from our own stem cells very much mediate the positive effects we see uh, uh, with our two cell lines, be it CTX or indeed the HRPC retinal cells. Um, importantly, because we have stem cells from which we can derive exosomes, we believe that we have an advantage in terms of our ability to, to both generate exosomes and to characterize them and get them to do things. And in that regard, our CTX-derived exosomes, we know, have an ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. That's key if one's targeting the CNS with advanced drugs. We know that our exosomes can carry um, therapeutic molecules of interest, such as small RNAs, CRISPR-Cas9 proteins, and so on. And importantly, we've been able to characterize uh, and expand our, our, our exosomes or, or in high yield in a stable and consistent manner using CTX cells, which is, is itself a clinical grade product um, as, as the starting or produce the cell line. And finally, we know that we can target, sorry, we can um, engineer our exosomes to target particular tissues as well in the body. And again, we've presented preclinical data in conference in that regard over the last couple of years. So how are we intending to exploit uh, the exosome platform in terms of realizing value? Well, as I mentioned at the start, we're working with third party pharmaceutical companies uh, under research collaborations where we will test our exosomes as a delivery vector for that company's um, advanced therapeutics, which might be small RNAs, oligonucleotide based drugs and so on. And the aim is to deliver over the next six to 12 months across these collaborations in vitro and in vivo proof of concept data, which we hope would then lead to license deals with these companies. And that's where we see the value being generated for a neuron subsequently. We have a number of these collaborations ongoing at the moment, around three or four with others in, uh, in the pipeline as well. So it's very much a, an outsourced endeavor with minimal spend required from a neuron. So in summary, um, I mentioned value realization and deal making a couple of minutes or so ago. And this slide just gives you a quick uh, um, snapshot of, of deal making recently uh, in the peer group. So companies that are working either with exosomes or in the case of JSite, working with um, uh, retinal stem cells targeting, in their case, retinitis pigmentosa, the same as us. Uh, JSite are a little bit further ahead than us. And this year they signed a, um, a territory deal with Santon, a Japanese pharma company for ex-US rights. And you can see the deal terms here were very substantial for a territory-based deal. So it gives you some indication of what deals can be secured when you get to the right data point, which is what we're targeting, of course, ourselves over the next uh, year or so. Uh, and again, on the exosome side, you can see players such as Kodiak in the US and Evox here in the UK, again, have been able to target or achieve rather very substantial license deals with third-party pharma companies off the back of early stage data, proof of concept data preclinically uh, with their own uh, exosome-based technology. So just to complete and sum up, uh, we do see major value creation opportunities in Renuron over the next 12 months, driven primarily by clinical data being garnered from the ongoing phase 2A study with our RP program. Um, and the data we've generated to date clinically compares very favorably with uh, what we see elsewhere in the field. Um, our exosome program is being advanced in a collaborative way through um, research collaborations, which we hope will lead to partnering deals if the proof of concept data is positive, whilst we actually retain rights to um, develop uh, those exosomes into other, other therapeutic areas as well. Um, and it's clear that there is potential increase, there is increasing interest rather in the potential of cell therapies both in ophthalmology and also uh, uh, in terms of exosomes as therapeutic agents or delivery vectors. And that is uh, clearly evidenced by some of the deal making we've seen just in the last year. And with that, I'll finish and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, let's get on to the questions then. First of all, 
Um, I'll read it out as I see it. What is the size of the retinous pigmentosa world market? It's a difficult question to answer because, of course, um, there's only one approved product in RP, and that only addresses around 1% to 3% of the RP population, um, which amounts to no more than a few thousand patients. In terms of RP as an indication, there are probably around uh, 150-odd thousand patients in the US, similar number in Europe, and similar numbers beyond, of course. Um, Luxturn is priced at, a, uh, at around, I think it's $425,000 per eye, so $850,000 per patient. But clearly that's an ultra-orphan uh, drug. Uh, I think all I can say is that for an orphan status indication like RP, um, if you can show the requisite efficacy, you can price your treatment at a very, very high level. So it's in, you know, if you, I think if you extrapolate, it is a billion dollar opportunity, notwithstanding the fact that it is a rare disease. It's actually quite one of the larger orphan indications. Uh, uh, and we believe that with the requisite efficacy, even though there is broad pricing pressure uh, in the broader industry, uh, for rare indications where the efficacy is good, high prices will still be commanded. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, what, what else we have here? How do these results compare with the Lux Turner drug? The Lux Turner drug. Yeah, Lux Turner actually, the, the interesting thing with Lux Turner, and again, I, I don't want to, to hold myself out as being a great authority on this, um, but what we do know is that they, they were able to go on a pivotal data at phase three using a different type of endpoint. They actually used a navigational maze as opposed to pure vision acuity on an ETPRS chart. Um, so maybe the comparison is more difficult to make, but their, their data at phase three was, was very compelling and ultimately that led to approval of the product. Um, when we look at other approaches that have used ETDRS at earlier stages in clinical development, um, then that's where we draw the encouragement because comparably, uh, from, on, on the basis of, of that comparison, the data we've generated so far looks very, very good. So providing we can continue to do what we have been doing clinically, then we believe that um, uh, you know, we'll find our, our way through for this, uh, for this intervention. Quite what the endpoint will be at phase three uh, is an open question until we've agreed the protocol with the regulator. But certainly based on ETDRS so far, we're very encouraged. Okay, excellent. So uh, what do we have here? It's a couple of questions, very similar. Um, to what extent does your company depend on key personnel? Um, that's an interesting question. I've had that one before. Yeah. Um, well, we're a very small company. Um, we've, we've actually scaled back a little bit this year because our stroke program is now being pursued as an out-licensed endeavor. Um, the first such one being obviously with Fosun in China. Um, it's enabled us to, you know, to, to, to scale back in terms of our own in-house resource. So, so we're, I think we're around 33 odd people now. So I suppose my, my pat reaction or answer to the question is that we're all key personnel. Every single person in that company really matters to us because we're very small. Uh, so everyone has their role to, um, you know, to, to perform. Um, and I think actually just as a, on a related issue, COVID, you know, has affected us in the way that it's affected virtually every company, but it's enabled us to continue working. So we, we are able to continue doing the work in our own labs uh, yeah. to the extent that people don't need to be in the lab, then they're, they're able to work from home where they need to. We're actually based in Wales, so there's a lot down there at the moment as well, which we're, we're managing to, uh, to manoeuvre ourselves uh, through. Um, but ultimately, you know, small companies depend on all their people and we're no different. Absolutely. And just um, as a subsequent to that same question, actually, part two, to what extent any intellectual property is safeguarded in the event of movement of key personnel? Yeah, well, we have, as you might imagine, we have standard contracts of employment that have very stringent IP provisions in them. Um, and that applies actually both in terms of what the employee generates in terms of IP and how that finds its way into the company's uh, intellectual property portfolio, and also uh, what an employer employee is able to do and not able to do once they have left the company. So again, we're no different from any other um, knowledge-based business in that regard in terms of how we protect our intellectual property, both in terms of defending it and ensuring that we keep uh, a strong hold on it. 
Okay, great, thank you. Here we are, uh, next one. If I've understood correctly, there is a Chinese partner, which you did mention earlier on in the presentation. Is there an intention to file for marketing authorization for the RP therapy in China? Yes, most definitely. Um, so Fosun Pharma, which is the company in question, have rights to develop uh, both our HRPC cells, the retinitis pigmentosa in China, and also our CTX cells for stroke, for stroke disability in that same territory. And they're currently pursuing uh, both of those endeavors. So the reason we did that deal was, was for just that reason. Uh, we don't have feet on the ground in China. Fosun are very, very well established there. And we couldn't hope for a better partner to drive those programs forward clinically. And we hope ultimately to market uh, in China, a very important market ultimately. Excellent. I've got time for one more question, Michael. Would you consider developing your HRPC for intravitreal injection? That's a very, very good question and a very pertinent one. And the simple answer is yes. Um, we do have um, uh, plans to, to look at how you know, other modes of administration for our therapy. We've done this with our other assets as well over the years. Um, we're very happy with subretinal injection, as I mentioned earlier, because it's important if we believe what these cells are actually doing in terms of mechanism of action, that they, they are delivered to the back of the eye, where we believe they will engender the, the most appropriate effect. But it's not impossible. In fact, it's already established that uh, you can inject these cells into the vitreous and they will still lend what's known as trophic support and engender some level of benefit through that means as well. Um, we haven't actually tested that yet with our own cells, but there are plans to do so. Yeah.